So former defensive coordinator Chuck Pagano has coached both Ray Lewis and Roquan Smith, and he recently gave some unique insight about how the two are similar. Yeah, and in doing that, Pagano made it clear why you still really can pay big money to an inside linebacker, especially to one at the Ray or Roquan level, because he said you simply cannot put a price tag on what they bring to the table. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside my co-host, Sarah Ellison. It is Thursday, July 13th. And this is your morning Ravens update from inside the vault. We are inching closer to the 2023 training camp. So that means it is time to pick out our breakout player candidates for this upcoming season. Plus, folks in Baltimore aren't the only ones who are just tired of hearing the Bengals run their mouths. You can add Patrick Mahomes to that list. <laughs> yeah, we have all of that and more coming up. Thank you for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news and our opinions in about 30 minutes. All right, so it's obviously no secret whatsoever just how much Roquan's sheer presence alone transformed Baltimore's defense in season a year ago, Sarah. It was a trade that just, it's hard to put, like you said, a price tag on the importance of it or just the importance of his presence. Uh, but statistically, the eye test, winning games, it transformed this team. And he now is a cornerstone piece defensively, whereas Lamar's the, the, you know, the offensive cornerstone piece. It's been really something to see in such a short amount of time. Uh, if you weren't a Ravens fan, as a lot of NFL fans are not, I mean, obviously they're there's other fans around the league. If you didn't see it yourself watching the whole season, I don't know that you would quite understand it. It is more of an eye thing, but just to, I did look up these numbers today to kind of give, try to give some statistics to it. <clears throat> I looked up where the Ravens ranked in two very important categories on defense through week eight. Okay. So this is all the games before Roquan get, got there in defensive points per game. The Ravens ranked number 20. So basically halfway through the season, they were number 20. By the end of the season, they were number three. Okay, this isn't like, okay, first eight weeks, number 20, second eight weeks, number three. No, he helped lift them from number 20 to number three overall, which is very hard to do. Then look at the red zone defense. How many times do we see meltdowns in this defense? Not with Roquan there as much. In the red zone, they went from number 23 before he got there. And then by the end of the year, number three. It is crazy to think. Obviously, everybody did get better in their play. But it's crazy that one man can help transform a defense like that. For real. And the numbers back that up over the last couple of years, obviously in Chicago and then in in Baltimore after the trade last year. The last two seasons, he has a per season average of the following in these categories. 166 tackles per season on average, almost four sacks on average per season, two picks per season on average, four and a half pass deflections, 11 and a half tackles for loss. He's a sideline to sideline guy, high IQ, somebody who doesn't say a whole lot, right? Like he's he, he's, he's not loud, boisterous, that kind of guy like Ray. And we'll get to what Chuck Pagano had to say in just a bit. Um, but you'd never know it for what he does on the field. He is fierce. At the same time, Sarah, he said some pretty bold things over the last couple mm -hmm. months, too, including when we had him on our show. So he may not be loud, but I think he is straight to the point and he can be extremely bold, essentially saying that, hey, this team, it's he didn't. I'm trying to remember specifically what he said on the night of the draft with us, but it was essentially like, hey, this is Super Bowl or bus territory in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. And he's also said he wants all that smoke. So, I mean, <clears throat> he, he isn't as I, I would say he's not as long winded as Ray, but he is definitely unafraid like Ray. And and yeah. like you said, very bold, confident, maybe even bordering on arrogant, uh, you know, it's but it's the same type of attitude. Someone who has great perspective on both of these guys, Ray Lewis and Roquan Smith, is former NFL head coach Chuck Pagano. Of course, former Ravens defensive coordinator 
um, back in, in 2011. Prior to that, he was the secondary coach from 08 to 10. Uh, he was with the Colts from 12 to 17, and he was last in the NFL from 2019 to 2020 as Chicago's defensive coordinator, which is why he can speak to Roquan. I thought he did a great job on the Glenn Clark show here locally in Baltimore, trying to find some parallels between the two, but most importantly, detailing from his perspective on just how important and impactful Roquan Smith is to a defense. This Ray is Ray, 17 years, Hall of Famer, arguably, you know, one of the best, if not the best, to ever play that position in the National Football League. No doubt. But some of the intangible things that people don't know, because you can see the skill set. Roquan, you pay a guy like that because you never have to bring take him off the field. You know, back in the day, those big inside linebackers, you got some first and second down guys, and then you got to get them off the field and get, you know, some athletic guy, guys that can run, guys that can cover. So Roquan's a guy that from a skill set, he's a three-down linebacker. You can blitz him, and he can get after the quarterback. I think he had five sacks last year, you know, coming into Baltimore. So the football IQ, the football character, he is so intelligent. And he understands and gets the game. He's like another coach on the field. So when you have him out there and he's got the green dot on his helmet and he's calling defenses, you know, that, that Mike McDonald is calling in, all of those, that you can't put a price on that. I mean, there are so many times where I just look out to Ray and go, because you trust guys that you know that are in the building mm-hmm. 24-7. They know the game plan inside and out. They know the opponent inside and out. You know, you can give them a game plan and say, hey, what do you like? What what don't you like? What's going to cause us some problems? What's too much for the guys? And they, they go through it and they scratch it out. And, and they give it back to them. And that's the kind of thing like Roquan, you can, you can give him that. He can handle all that stuff. He can unwind. When I say unwind, there's so many things that happen now. It's so, such a fast-paced game and all the multiple wide receiver sets and formations and all these different route combinations and you play two, three, four different zone coverages, man coverages. There's a lot of communication uh, that has to go on there to be successful down in and down out. And for him to be able to tie the front and the back together from Mm. a communication standpoint. Mm. And then his skill set is just, it's off the chart. So he's not, you guys probably got to know, listen to him. He doesn't say a whole lot. No. Uh, You know, he's a, he's a, he's a quiet guy. But don't be fooled. Inside that, that head and that big brain of his is always churning. So, again, that was a, a long answer. But you can't, no, you I, can't put a price on everything that he brings to the table for that organization. Oh, my gosh. I mean, <laughs> long-winded. Keep going, Chuck. Like, the amount that we can learn from somebody with his football acumen and, and Chuck's sense, you know, in and, and Chuck's case – I, I found that to be so fascinating. He can unwind. He's like another coach on the field. He, mm. He's he got tr- tr- tremendous IQ. I mean, he he's go, goes on and on. And, and, you know, remember, too, Mike McDonald made it clear that, you know, for the first time, Roquan's going to be the primary green dot wearer. You know, that yep. was Chuck Clark last year. So that's another responsibility added in. But he really is like first one in, last one out. And it shows not not – not always are those types of guys the best players on the field. In Roquan's case, that might just be him week in and week out. Right. And Bobby, it's it's crazy because, you know, Roquan, if you looked at it individually, right, you're just looking at his individual stats. He, he is off the charts, right? Like he was number three last season in tackles across across the board, had four four point five sacks. Great for great stuff there. OK, but he's been number two in tackles since he was drafted. So it's not like that has changed. So he, you know, he still is this high, high volume stat guy. He could maybe be number one next year. Easy, easy with this defense. But even though he has those stats, the NFL is trying to say, no, we don't play inside linebackers anymore. So why the heck would the Ravens do that? Why would the Ravens give a number two draft pick and then give them 20 million a year? And and I feel like what Chuck what Chuck is saying is it's it's these intangibles. And I want to add to what he's saying because you highlighted some of the stuff you said really well, right? Like he's another coach on the field. You combine that with you never have to take that coach off. And then you can say, is is this a good game plan? 
I mean, there are only so many people you can do that with where guys are that smart while still having the body and the skill set to do it. The other intangibles, he, 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 he kind of, he kind of like, and you did too, kind of highlighted it, but it's this, this, it's this mindset, right? It's this mindset of, I remember when Ray did play and we had those Kyler Bowler years and I'm like, Oh, another three and out, but then I'd get excited. Right. Because it was like, I know Ray and Ed and Suggs are about to come on the field. And then if by some chance an offense got into the red zone, it was still like, all right, well, bet Ravens are going to get a get a turnover here or at the very best, you're going to get three points. It was this mindset. So then when you had other guys come in, either, either younger, younger guys or whatever, free agents for other teams that didn't know the culture, it was like you're in that, you know, third and one on the five yard line and you look over at Ray and Ray saying, this is not happening. You are not getting this one yard. And so you are no longer shaking in your cleats while you're on the field. It's like, if Ray believes we can do it and Ray's like, you know, steam coming out of his ears, then all of a sudden I believe I can do it. And so that's why you, you see, and then you see it statistically when you go from number 23 in the red zone to number three. And so he's almost like, this accountability. I was actually on another podcast today with Ken McCusick over at Film Study, and I loved an analogy he used. He said, guys like Ray and guys like Roquan, Roquan can bring that now. And he used the analogy voice of God, right? Um, and he was using that in the, ter- in the in the sense that not only do you have a coach on the field now, but this voice of God is now the a- accountability for everybody. And so when that when that voice speaks, and you don't even have to believe in God to understand this analogy, right? It, the the idea of it is when that voice speaks, you don't want to you don't want to disappoint it. And so there's other guys that hold you accountable, but some guys may do it in a way that make you mad and they're in your face and they're yelling at you. But the voice of God, it's almost like your dad, you don't want to disappoint him because they care about you. It's not because they're going to beat you down if, if you don't get it right. And so that kind of, that's the intangibles that I think that Chuck is talking about that even though Roquan and Ray are different players, they definitely were and Ray's hall of famer. Roquan is all pro, but you know, he's got a ways to go to be, to be considered a hall of famer. And so, but it's, it's this idea that it's like, it's these intangibles that you cannot put a price tag on, except the Ravens did. And they said, yeah, that's worth 20 million a year because we could see with our eyes. And even though some of these tangibles, we can't back it up with numbers. We all saw what that does to a defense. So, mm-hmm. so you can't get stuck in these ways where it's like, oh yeah, you can't pay that position because it's inside linebacker. No, we all saw the difference that he makes. I think we should put on our short list tracking down Chuck to have like an hour conversation yeah. on just Roquan and get his perspective because, you know, he was a heck of a defensive coordinator in the NFL and he was a heck of a head coach in Indianapolis. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, he's a cancer survivor as well. So mm-hmm. he's a really impressive person. Uh, he's doing some media stuff with the 33rd team. I know he interviewed Greg Roman not too long ago. We did an entire episode on that. So I really uh, enjoyed that hat tip, obviously to Glenn Clark And I'll just finish with this, you know, to kind of put a bow on the topic. Roquan makes me think about one of my favorite life phrases, sort of a motivational phrase that I use just personally. And that's the relentless pursuit. He brings a relentless pursuit Mm -hmm. to the game of football in so many different departments, whether it's the film study, relentless pursuit, whether it's the leadership, relentless pursuit, whether it's his media obligations. We know he gave he, he, he gave his all to us for 20 minutes of his own time night. Um, You know, the, obviously uh, his on field football play speaks for itself. And, and that phrase is something that I think can be contagious. I think it can become something that, that, that can galvanize a group and I can't wait to see it, you know, come to fruition, hopefully over the course of a 17 game, 18 week season, he was with this team only for a fraction of last year. And yet, Look, listen to the way we're talking about him. Like, yeah, wasted no time whatsoever. You know this. We've talked about this. I've seen him multiple times this offseason just getting to know the area, whether it was mm-hmm. community driven, whether it was his love for restaurants and food. He has wasted no time whatsoever. We've gotten to know his marketing team a little bit, uh, just, you know, kind of off off script and, and, and catching up with them about booking him for interviews and whatnot. And they've told us this guy 
absolutely cements himself into his community where he is. He did the exact same thing in Chicago. He's doing it now in Baltimore, and I can't wait to see what year two and his first full season looks like coming up in 2023 with Baltimore. Well, and Bobby, I will move on to the second topic, but um, I just want to say uh, this type of stuff, you don't just want to see it in your football players, this type of stuff you apply to your own life, right? Like how can you have a relentless pursuit in your own life? Again, I've said this many times. This is why I love working with you. You have that same sort of zest. We're not football players. We're not built for it, <laughs> but we bring it to our personal lives. And it's uh, like, uh, Lamar Jackson retweeted today some quote that said, you know, make sure the people in your in your friend group um, have actual goals and not just plan for the weekend. Like you want to be around people who want to be great. And and so that's why I love that's why I just love Roquan. But moving into the second topic here, talking about breakout players. So um, <clears throat> Jeff Srebeck of The Athletic. Well, not just him. Every all the all the beat reporters um, had to put in a breakout player for their team. So each beat reporter for 32 teams did this. So I was going to read Jeff's breakout uh, player. And then, and it's a good one, but then each of us have to pick a, another breakout player that's different from his. All right. So we'll give cool. Jeff's first and then Bobby, you'll come off of that and, and maybe give yours first. All right. So his is a good one. Running back JK Dobbins. Let me read what he says here. He says, there's been a lot of noise this offseason about Dobbins, who didn't participate in the Ravens mandatory minicamp amid speculation that he's unhappy with his contract situation. Dobbins is entering the final year of his rookie deal, and that will keep him plenty motivated. He's another year removed from a major knee injury. New offensive coordinator Todd Munkin likes to get his backs involved in the passing game, and that should help Dobbins' numbers. Dobbins has had... Dobbins has had more than 15 carries in just one game in his entire career. A bigger workload is long overdue. That's from Jeff Rebeck. Bobby, I agree. I think JK is going <laughs> to run all over the place in this offense. Oh yeah. He's got a lot to, lot to prove, not to us, but to himself and the rest of the league and maybe even the Ravens front office, if you ask him based on the, the, the hold in for a mandatory mini camp. But I'm sure we'll revisit that at some point during training camp. And I think that's a shoe in that he's obviously a, a popular candidate. It makes a whole lot of sense just for the spirit of this exercise. I know you're going to go defense, so I'm going to go offense okay. and I'm going to go with a second year tight end in a coastal Carolina kid, Isaiah likely. Uh, looking at his numbers from last year, 16 games, uh, 60 targets, 36 receptions, 373 yards, three touchdowns, and uh, he was reliable. He certainly had uh, his, his fair share of growing pains, but when I think about all the retooling that this team has done to its wide receiver core, I think about how much a secondary and opposing team's defense is going to have to deal with this year. Somebody's going to see the, the, you know, the advantage there, the fruits of that labor being that there's going to be so much more of a threat, you know, variety. And so I think one of those guys, the, one of the benefactors of that could be Isaiah likely. He's somebody who is nimble. He has a, a great pair of hands on him. He is explosive he plays alongside Mark Andrews, which is obviously an advantage in itself because of how much uh, attention he commands. And now when you think about guys on the outside, like Odell Beckham Jr. and Rashad Bateman and maybe you know Zay Flowers inside in the slot, wherever he ends up playing and, and, and having his fair share of, uh, of snaps, I really do believe that a guy like Isaiah likely can, can emerge. I'm sorry, Q, he's, he's out there probably, <laughs> you know, pounding air right now, hope, wishing that this was going to be Charlie Kohler. But I got to go with Isaiah likely because I thought he showed flashes last year that he can be that guy in a future Pro Bowl tight end. Who you got? Well, real quick, I just want to push back on yours a little bit. I think it's a little bit bold, not because I don't think <clears throat> that Isaiah likely can be good. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I, I just think there's too many mouths to feed. And so I guess it, it's kind of like the definition of what breakout is. Do I think that he could have three or 400 yards? Yeah, but I wouldn't define that as a breakout player. Do you think he's going to be more than that? I do. I do. I think okay. he's going to have more. I think he's going to have more statistically. 
than three or 400 yards. And I, I get it. You know, there's, there's only one football as Todd Munkin has said many times, yeah. and he's probably got the biggest challenge of any of them, right? of anybody yeah. top down trying to make everybody happy on this team. But, you know, I, I think Isaiah showed me last year that he's got chemistry with Lamar. He yeah. kills you in the open, in the open part of the field. And um, I get the sense that, that he could be one of those guys. Again, I don't think he's going to be the only guy that's yeah. going to cash in here. You know, ultimately is going to be guys. Look, Mark Andrews is going to draw a ton of attention. Odell, if he's healthy and explosive right out of the gate, he's going to draw a lot of attention. It's just a matter of who, who's going to be that, that open, open ended guy. And I think he could be one of them. All right. So my guy on defense, I'm going to take Kyle Hamilton. Um, I think that Kyle Hamilton, all he did was ascend last year. And again, my idea of a breakout player is where more <clears throat> people nationally start to know their name. And I think obviously everybody in Baltimore already knows, already knows Kyle, but I think that, um, yeah, he just ascended. I think his athleticism is off the charts. He's that Swiss army knife and, oh, I will put this out there. And again, this stems from my conversation today with, with Ken over at film study. Um, we talked a little bit about the number three corner, the, the slot and the nickel. And I'm not saying for sure that this will be the answer, but Kyle Hamilton is one option that I feel like we've kind of overlooked on our show a little bit where he could legitimately Ken Ken gets these numbers, right? Where, um, he knows what packages the Ravens are. He, he tracks it and he said the Ravens are in nickel package basically 80% of the time. And so he was like, you know, you got to look at the defensive backs as a whole, not just corners versus versus safeties. And he thinks that one option, he still thinks really somebody else is going to be signed, but one option could be that Kyle Hamilton plays that slot corner. And then when they happen to go down to like four defensive backs, then he can play that strong safety role. But he thought that Geno Stone, what you got to look at is who's the best fifth defensive back, not just like the third best uh, cornerback, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. And so that would put Geno Stone on the, on the field who has also been ascending. And, and that's might be why Bobby, the Ravens were so in on Amos before he signed with the jets because of the Chuck Clark injury best to, to Chuck Clark. So wherever Hamilton is playing, whether it's, you know, it's strong safety, Maybe they mix up, put a little free safety, although that's more Williams um, slot corner. He is the Swift's ar army knife. And I do think he's probably going to want to, you know, dig his teeth into one spot. So wherever they end up putting him, I think he's going to break out. And I think he's going to become a name that, that more people will know beyond the Ravens. All right. So, and I like the way you define that too, because we mm -hmm. can often get caught up in like, oh no, everybody knows this guy or everybody knows yeah. this storyline in Baltimore. Well, that's not usually the case outside the market. So I do like the way you define that. So you're going with Kyle Hamilton. I'm going to go with Isaiah likely. I think certainly it's, it's, there were a bunch of guys that I kind of wrestled back and forth with, I think a close second. And maybe I just wanted some variety here. So maybe I was thinking David Ajabo, but when you said Kyle yeah. Hamilton, I was like, ah, let me, let me just give a little bit of, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, let's offense. get somebody in offense on, involved yeah. here. But I think Ajabo should absolutely uh, be in the yeah. conversation um, as, you know, and I know technically this is looked at as, as his rookie year, if you will, having lost the, the majority of last year to the aftermath of that uh, torn Achilles and the rehab that was required. But I think he should probably be at the top of that conversation as well. All right, so um, let's see here. We'll, we'll, we'll head into some quick hits, but <laughs> let's start with our favorite, or my favorite. Bobby, where is this? Okay, so so we saw this video on Twitter. Uh, Dov Kleiman tweeted out, but was this going into... There, okay, so it's basically some behind-the-scenes uh, audio and video of Patrick Mahomes with the Kansas City Chiefs. Was this... This is obviously going into the AFC Championship game, correct? Yeah, and this is yeah. a snippet of it's so uh, new. Uh, yeah, this is really good. And and there's been a ton of different snippets. We're only going to share this one because I know a lot of folks within Ravens Nation will enjoy this because, you know, since he's done, the, the, the Bengals have done a lot of talking over the last year or so. And uh, but 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 this snippet is of basically Netflix has a new series coming out called Quarterback. And I I'm definitely going to be setting aside some time before training camp to watch this 
because it is raw. It is up close and personal, and this is as good as it gets access wise. So anyway, going into the AFC title game between Buffalo and Cincinnati, Patrick Mahomes was asked who he likes. I think the Bengals are better, but I think with all those injuries on the whole line, the Bills have a chance. I mean, I, wanna, I mean, I think we match up better versus the Bills, but I want to play the Bengals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just honestly, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just want to play if we haven't beat them. I'm tired of them talking. About them. <laughs> I think we match up better with the Bills, but I want the Bengals for obvious reasons. They talk too much. Well, and by the way, now that I think about it, it couldn't have been the AFC. Ch- uh, they were going into the division around because obviously they, they, they were going to play in the in the AFC championship because um, it's not like they, they played uh, in the Super Bowl. So anyway, they do talk too much. I have never seen a team and we're bringing it up because a it's just a funny quote, but also it's in the AFC North man. And that's why bringing talking about Roquan Smith again. His my favorite quote of his offseason, I think he said this one on the lounge, is he was like, we want the smoke. We want the smoke from the Bengals. Give them to us again. Because it's like, you know, that the, the, they did not give a lot, give up a lot of points on defense. It was the obviously the backbreaker fumble, um, force fumble and then return for a touchdown that really blew that game in the other direction. And so uh, I, I, lo- I mean, it's funny because it should be guys like the Patrick Mahomes who does talk a lot because he's been backing it up. But the Bengals, they have a little taste of success and they are good. They are good with with their, you know, new players and all that. They got a lot of a lot of good talent, but man, for a team that's never won a Super Bowl, they sure do talk a lot. No kidding. Yeah, and, and good catch there too, just to be abundantly clear. This was that game between Buffalo and Cincy was in the divisional round and the winner yeah. would go on and face Kansas City who had already had their um, their tickets punched to to the AFC Championship game. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, – by the way, go ahead and, and take a look at some of these snippets if you haven't already. They're all over Twitter. Mahomes does – he does just as much talking, okay? There's a, there's a great clip of him and Max Crosby going head-to-head, uh, st- standout pass rusher for the Vegas Raiders, and, and it's hilarious. So love it. I love it. It's great access, and there'll be more to come. Next topic uh, along the, the lines of, of quick hits, former Ravens owner Art Modell is one of 60 semifinalists for enshrinement in the Pro Football Hall of Fame class of 2024 all of those semifinalists were announced on wednesday and of course we know that modell passed away back in 2012 at the age of 87 one of the game's most influential owners and we all know he has hall of fame worthy credentials it's just a matter of will the voters get him in that remains to be seen uh something to be on the lookout for though this summer I'm not getting my hopes up on that one. It's been so many times he's been put in there. Uh, Final, final quick hit coming from the 33rd team uh, Twitter account. So Hall of Famer Rondé Barber, he put up the seven best secondary units in the NFL right now. Okay. And uh, I'll give you number seven is the 49ers, 49ers, number six, Cowboys, number five, Seahawks, number four, Broncos, number three, Eagles, number two, Ravens and number one, the Jets. Uh, so I think that Barber knows what he's talking about. I've decided here, <laughs> Hall of Fame defensive back. I mean, uh, it's funny that he does have him at number two, but I I would think that here in Baltimore we're a little bit nervous <laughs> about the the secondary. I feel really good about you know the starters, but the depth behind that. We just talked about Kyle Hamilton and the number three cornerback. We're a little bit nervous, so I think we're nervous about the depth. But you know, I love Hamilton and Williams and Humphrey, and we'll see what Rocky Sin brings. So that I like, but beyond that, it gets a little bit dicey. Top two is a good position to be in if you ask me so that's we'll we'll see where the, where the ravens end up stacking up at the end of the year but preseason top two in terms of secondaries from a guy who knows that position i like it I want to finish here too and i think this is a great place to finish and and that is probably my biggest takeaway not probably the biggest takeaway from the 2023 espies which is basically you know um acknowledging the best stories the best performances the best 
individual accolades in sports from the year that was. And when DeMar Hamlin had a chance to present the Pat Tillman Award for service to the Buffalo Bills training staff on stage in front of everybody, in front of the entire sports world, it, it was a chilling in every sense, you know, chilling in the best of ways, powerful moment. And, and of course, the Bills, when he went into cardiac arrest on Monday Night Football last season, the Bills training staff were there. And, and it was really, really powerful. If you haven't already, please go and check out that video. DeMar Hamlin is literally a walking miracle. And the fact that he is expected to play, who even cares if he doesn't even play a snap? But the fact that he is going to be a member of the Buffalo Bills this upcoming season is pretty freaking cool. So thought that would be a good place to end this Thursday morning vault edition. As always, we wanted to shout out and thank two of our returning patrons who are supporting both of us, our channel, our audio only show through Patreon this month, Jaron Fonville and Christopher Saxe. We appreciate you both. And if you're interested in doing the same, you can check out what we're offering by visiting patreon.com forward slash Ravens vault podcast for so for my co-host Sarah Ellison I'm Bobby Trossett signing off from this Thursday morning vault edition we'll be back with more on Friday as always you can hit us up with feedback we want to know what you're thinking of this new format as we experiment and as we get ready for the 2023 season reach us at Baltimore Ravens vault at gmail.com and as always thanks for spending some time with us inside the vault